Hello and welcome to Bottom Line, your weekly enlightenment and good governance talk show. Tonight we'll have as our guest a household name, Alahaji Ibrahim Ben Kabo or IB Kabo, a man with many hearts, former proprietor of a New Citizen Tulumbo newspaper, former president of the Sierra Leone Association of Journalists Large, former minister of information and communications, and former advisor to president. In a humble setting at Regent, west of Freetown, I sampled his experience about life in journalism and politics. First, was his background? Well, Ibrahim Ben Kagu, uh, I was born years ago in the northern province of Makini. And why my father decided to give me that name, I would not know. But of course, he himself being a Muslim, decided that I could have a Muslim name. And uh, we were at it for a lifetime. And I'm happy that uh, I've come to this point and I've served this nation well to my best of my, my ability. And I'm happy that we also have mentored people like you people, to succeed us when time goes by. So to us, it's important. I'm happy that you are here this morning. We first uh, knew about the name Alahaji Ibrahim Ben Kabo. Um, as a journalist, I mean, in the circle of journalism and all of this, I mean, how did it all start? Well, of course, I would tell you that uh, I was not even a journalist at that time. I was merely a school teacher. After graduation from the university, I went straight to Bo to teach. And some of the children knew me very well as an IV cargo, and I carried that name for a while. Um, until it became necessary for me to address the issue of journalism in this country. I became a journalist, and everybody knew me as I.B. Kago, and Ibrahim Ben Kago became a popular name thereafter. So I'm happy that you remember the fact that I also was called Ibrahim Ben Kago, even though my name was I.B. Kago as a school teacher. And then today, we, I still carry the name I.B. Kago. Talk to me about the four steps. Uh, towards journalism? Well, of course, um, the reason I went into journalism was very, very clear. I had quite a number of friends who wanted us to share ideas, intellectual ideas, as to how to address certain issues in society. And therefore, some of us decided that we could use the journalism route to address these issues. So we had a good number of them. But of course, there were also challenges. Because in those days, the government of the day would not accept too many criticisms. So if you are going into journalism, you should be very, very cautious, very careful. Make sure that you address all of the issues which you think you must address. So this was the way we did it. But again, I must state that a good number of people in society encouraged us. They wanted to see young intellectuals taking part in the business of uh, bringing news to the public. And uh, this is how we came into it. I still remember people like... Uh, Frank Busua, myself, and others. And uh, we all decided that uh, we should be part of this whole process. And we are appreciated by some people. And uh, up to this time, I'm satisfied that I have played my own role. I mean, um, one would wonder, you were a teacher, I mean, helping to transform young people, helping to build, I mean, future leaders, if you like. And all of a sudden, journalism became the order of the day. Simply because I would not see any much difference between journalism and teaching. We also use the opportunity as teachers to, make, to mentor young people. And some of them were actually interested in journalism. They wanted to know what was happening in the country. But of course, we brought them on board. And that is what has brought us to this point. I'm very satisfied that some of them have proven to be very, very successful. And some of them have proven to be very, very useful in society. So to us, the question is quite relevant that um, you were a teacher and suddenly you became a journalist. Yes? That was what happened. And this is why I am now a journalist, also a politician, if you don't mind. Um, let's talk about the long walk to press freedom in your days. I mean, because I mean, you made the point that becoming a journalist then, you know, writing all what you needed to write, and considering the laws that we have in our country, and it was um, quite peculiar. So what were the struggle days like um, during your days? Well, it was a very Herculean task. Don't forget that uh, the people in power in those days would not accept a lot of criticisms. 
and don't also forget that uh, people who were part of the process of running the state would also misunderstand very basic issues. So uh, it was not easy. So everything that you wanted to do has to be properly, properly monitored by yourself. Otherwise, you run into serious difficulties. I remember the case of Fode, uh, Fode Kande, who was a sports uh, writer and a great friend of ours, who made the mistake of just writing the wrong thing about a foreign president, not our own president. And he was arrested and locked up. But of course, he was released later because we had the skills of getting Shekhar Stevens to listen to us. Um, so, By the way, what were those skills? Well, the skills were that he just go and praise Shekhar Stevens, that he was a great leader. He was the leader that wanted to improve, improve this country. And could he please release our friend, uh, Mr. Fode Kande? And he said, OK, yes, you boys are growing up very rapidly. And then that was a skill that we used many, many times. And a good number of people, of course, other people used that same skill during that period. I mean, we remember the names like the recordings, um, Dr. Spencer, as if you like, now the late uh, Jonathan Lee, they sacrificed their freedom. They were locked up in the uh, cells at Adenba Road and all of those during those, you know, difficult days. I mean, okay, all, of us, all, of us, all of us were yeah, locked yeah, up. Yeah. All of us were locked up. We all we are in jail. And back to Sam Short and others were also locked up. Uh, Sam Hollist was locked up. In fact, he was the first victim of the 95 Public Order Act. And uh, we sympathized with him, but he came out as a brave man and continued his job. Yes, uh, Ulu Godin and others, all of them were locked up. <laughs> victims of the 95 Public Order Act. So that's the whole problem. And all of us were locked up. Uh, if you make too many mistakes in this job in those days, they will lock you up. And later on, they will release you. And then somebody will come to your house at night to apologize to you that uh, it was not deliberate, etc., etc. But the fact is that uh, these are all people who suffered on, as a result of that legislation. So we, want, we don't want that to happen again. This is why we fought very, very hard to find a way of removing that legislation. It was a nasty legislation for a civilized society. Now, uh, Ivy, your newspaper, the Citizen newspaper, attracted many people to a particular column, uh, The Last Word, if you like. Um, I mean, that was more like a storytelling column. Was... But then you combined uh, European and, if you like, African settings all together. I mean, we read um, about district commissioners, if you like. We read about, you know, the traditional leaders. By, by Makum, Maku, uh, Yes, of course. What was the sense behind that story? Well, we wanted the public to understand what obtained in this country in terms of uh, uh, administration of the state. Uh, those people I mentioned in those articles are mostly administrators, uh, chiefs, etc., etc. We wanted the public to get a feel of what used to happen. And um, of course, I'm sure the message went down. And we also wanted young people to understand what was happening in this country in this gone by. And I'm sure that quite a lot of our young people benefited from those articles. Yes, that was a very interesting column. A good number of people did. Of course, somebody uh, 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 took it away from us, uh, pirated it, and took it to London and wanted to publish it until Desimona discovered that he was doing that and he was stopped. But because some people saw some kindness in it, some goodness in it, they enjoyed it. Therefore, they wanted to be part of it. It was a good column, and I'm sure that uh, the public, now I'm compiling the whole book itself. Uh, the whole book itself will tell the entire story of how it all started and how people are going to benefit from it as a historical document. To us, it's important that we look at it from that angle as well. Let's talk about the setting. I mean, why the Street Commission? Why um, the chief, the traditional chiefs, in the same setting? What are you actually saying? Well, those were the ones who made the news in those days. Uh, I remember in my other book, I wrote about my father and his role, the role he played. But the fact of the matter is that it was the district commissioners, the court messengers, the parliament chiefs that made the news. And if you wanted to capture them, you wanted to capture the role they played in history, you must bring them together in a setting like I have presented. So to us, it's important that you have brought up this point. These, the, the court messengers, the district commissioners, 
the chiefs and others are very important elements in the history of this country. And therefore, any attempt by us to make sure that we write about them, we should bring them together and make sure that uh, the public goes, this, the news goes down to the public. Did you see anything coming in this country then? I mean, giving you the calls to start talking. Because remember, I mean, going through the last word, it will always end with either some parable or some piece of advice, as the case may be. Well, of course, we always will come with the last statement of advice. Don't forget that uh, we had come from very difficult times at some point and wanted also the public to understand that there are certain things in society that you should not do. And you should not do certain things that will jeopardize society itself. So if you see the chief commissioner uh, flogging an ordinary worker in public, you caution him that this is not the right thing to do one day those people will rebel. These are some of the stories we want to tell to the public. Because how did you manage that? I mean, this was a daily publication. And it was on for years. For years, yes, of course. Uh, like I said, I'm, going, I'm compiling the whole book itself. Uh, it was not an easy task. I blessed my wife for the patients sitting down because sometimes I sit on bed, on the bed to write my stories. And I put the light on and I create a whole lot of confusion for her. So I will also, will also appreciate her patience. But this was what I did over the years, writing those stories day in and day out. To us, it's important that we have them. And I also remember those were the days when Alahaji Ibrahim Ben Kabu, well, in our days then, mm -hmm. um, then it was the, the late former president, Alhaji Tijan Kaba. Alhaji Ibrahim Ben Kabu was almost like the moderator on SMBS in those days of all government programs. How was that? Like? Well, because uh, Alhaji Kaba had confidence in me, he was a relative of mine, a friend of mine. And my father mentored most of them in their category in those days when they came from England. So he had confidence in me. So I did most of the programs which he wanted me to do. I remember the case of a minister who ran foul of uh, President Kaba. And uh, the president said, OK, I'm not going to talk to you anymore. Can you imagine a president not talking to a minister? The minister will go to hell. We will we, we'll go mad. So this minister came to me and said, uh, uh, Mr. Kago, your friend is not talking to me. I feel very embarrassed, etc., etc. I said, what did you do? He said, no, it's a, an issue about a contract, this and that. I said, could you allow me to talk to him briefly? So I went to President Kabana and I said, Mr. President, I, said, DC. I call him DC. I said, you don't send your workers to Coventry. You talk to them. He said, what happened? I explained to him. He said, okay, well, he said, take him to the television and interview him. <laughs> if he comes out well, then I'll be satisfied. So I took this guy to the television, and he performed remarkably well. I did not telephone Pakaba again about the outcome of that program. But uh, he called me, he said, oh, yes, I, I listened to the program. I saw it, and it was good. He said, tell the fellow to come and see me. This is how Kaba, this is how Kaba operated. So this is it, yes, that was a good observation. Pakaba was very, very fond of me, to the extent that at some point, he actually gave me money to do certain programs for him. Uh, which I appreciated very much in those days. So that was the situation. I mean, I, I, I'm wondering about the skills that you combined. We are talking about a print journalist publishing stories in his newspaper, The New Citizen, The Last Word, have that and all of this. Yes. And by the same talking, this same person moderating programs on mm -hmm. television. On television yes. What was the secret behind the skill adapting both print and electronic life? Well, it's just hard work, um, and uh, he decided that uh, certain things must be done with well, hard, hard work. And I must also say that even at the SLBC, we had people who cooperated with us. Who it was, it was SLBS us. then. SLBS, yes. uh, who cooperated with us and who wanted us to succeed. And because they also saw the, the politicians as our opponents, quote unquote. So if we have any assignment that will require that we participate, in any of the political programs, they always will cooperate with us. Like, like Bremer, for example, will cooperate with you so that your program comes out well. You mean Mustafa Bremer? Mustafa Bremer. And others, they will cooperate with you. So we had no difficulty in the area of cooperation. And uh, to us, it's important that we recognize the fact that even though I.B. Kabo was there addressing the issues on television, I.B. Kabo was writing these articles, other people supported that whole process. 
Then he became president of the Senegal Association of Journalists, Large. Large. And what became remarkable about that tenure was this popular program on the UN radio then, uh, Front Page. Front Page, yes. And I remember uh, you, your good self, uh, the likes of David Tambayo, Isaac Masakoy. You had very fierce but accommodating uh, debates with the then um, Information Minister, Professor yes. Setimos Kaikai. Yes. How did he come across to you? Well, of course, uh, that was a clear indication of a democratic practice. For example, uh, Septimus Kaikai had no business taking part in these programs, but he wanted to take part, and he came out very, very well, and strongly as well. So to us, that was a, a very important indication that if we move one more step, this country will move towards real democracy. So I remember again, quoting Kaba again, after one of our encounters with the uh, Septimus Kaikai, I went to Kaba late in the afternoon and he said, I, I listened to your program today. Uh, you did very, very well. He said, well, you have given my minister a very hard time. I said, please, this is politics. But the fact of the matter is that that program was also a very important program that brought the journalists together. Some journalists would sit down on a Saturday, the whole day, listening to Front Page. To us, it was, it was an important program. So yes, I agree with you entirely. The front page was a very interesting program, and I also pay tribute to Septimus Kaikai for allowing us in those days to be part of that whole process, and he also took part in the process. What message does that send? I mean, we are talking about a government minister sitting on a program defending pro government positions, president of large order, if you like, troubles of journalists. And I mean, really critiquing governance system then, and, and taking the task seriously. And uh, of course, they, they, they also know. Because what also happens is that uh, the United Nations wanted to use that program as a yardstick of a gradual return to democratic practice, whether in fact the whole concept of a tolerance was taking place in Sierra Leone. And we made sure that we sent the message home to the UN itself. You know, because when I went to the UN for the creation of the SLBC, uh, one of the questions they asked was whether in fact we were going to sustain that kind of system. And I told them, I said, yes. Don't forget that Sierra Leone and Burundi were the two countries that were used as the guinea pigs for, by the Peace Commission of the United Nations to improve on the tolerance mechanisms of those countries. And uh, we succeeded in convincing the UN that Sierra Leone is on board. We, we, uh, Burundi did not succeed. They, they, they dropped on the wayside because they could not continue. Well, the fact of the matter is that what you saw on those programs was also a clear indication that uh, the SLBS at the time was preparing itself to move towards one more step, where you are now. I and mean, then um, those are days where you actually, you are known as a pure and applied journalist. Everything about you was about journalism as far as we knew and saw it coming. And then suddenly, um, after the 2007 uh, presidential and general elections, the name Ibrahim Ben Kabu was announced as the new Minister of Information and Communication. How did that, that happen? Well, that was the, the problem, because in the first instance, I was brought up to be a journalist. Um, I was brought up to be a, a writer. I, I was not brought up to be a real politician. But of course, I must have the stakes when I was called, I was going to present a letter, a, a, a lecture uh, in, in, uh, in Rwanda on peace development in West Africa, including Sierra Leone. I was on board the plane when uh, the telephone called and the president said, are you in town? I said, no, I'm not in town, I'm flying out of the country. And he said, if you come back, please see me. And that was Ernest Koroma. He said, I would want you to be my minister of information. I said, let us look at it when I come back. So I came back and he confronted me again and we decided that, uh, okay, we could help where we could help. So that is the situation. Are yeah, you prepared for that? Psychologically, no. Well, of course, with our training, you know, a journalist, you're always prepared. Believe me, if they appoint you today as minister, you'll be prepared psychologically because you'll be trained up for that purpose. Those of us who are journalists are always prepared to take up to the challenge. What are your first few days like for, you know, um, President of Slage 
well-known journalist, now politician, Minister of Information and Communication, the first few days and probably the first few months. How are they like? No, well, of course, I, I, thank, I say thanks to uh, Septimus because he was the minister whom I succeeded and he made the transition for me quite easy and I enjoyed the transition. And like I said, as a journalist, as a writer, I do not think that it was too much of a challenge. It was just a matter of time before I, I took up to the challenge and I succeeded in accepting the challenge. I think to a large extent I did what I could do to send a message home to the public and to the people who appointed me to that office. I mean, during your tenure as president of SLAGE, you're very vocal about the repeal of uh, Part 5 of the Public Order Act uh, of 1965, calling on the government, you know, calling on the need to repeal that because it was actually affecting uh, journalism, it was actually affecting journalists. So you're very vocal, I remember, even on that program. That of course, about. yes. And then you became Minister of Information and Communications so the hopes of media practitioners, their hopes we are actually, you know, way up there. Mm -hmm. It got dashed mm -hmm. at the 11th hour 59 minutes. To them, you became very disappointed because you had a snail-paced approach to the repeal of Part 5. Not much was done during that time, do you agree? You're right. Because the whole concept of... Uh addressing the issue of the Part 5 of the Nazi Survival Radio Order Act must be the centerpiece of any journalist in this country. He's thinking on everything. And all of us who are journalists thought that it has to be repealed. We thought it had to be repealed because it was obnoxious. And uh, we started the whole process. And Mark, you, I will confess to you that I did all I could do up to the level of cabinet. And then suddenly things were not moving the way uh, some of us wanted them to move. But the fact of the matter is that we sent the message home that that was not the right thing to do to keep that legislation in the books. And in the end, I feel very happy that uh, these new people, uh, the new government, came up with the whole idea of looking at it. What crippled, what crippled those efforts of yours then? No, that was a political decision. Let me tell you one thing. There is no way you, as a journalist, can convince non-journalists about the honesty of journalism. I told them that even where we repeal this act, we repeal this legislation, it will not affect anybody. Nobody will be killed, nobody will be affected. When they said, no, no, we are not too sure about what was happening, this and that and that. Well, the fact that I felt very disappointed. And I thought more could have been done than that was, that was done at that time. The former president, um I mean, it was suggest had the repeal as part of his campaign promises yes. when he was uh, running for uh, the presidency. And then when you became the Minister of Information, I mean, it all, like we're saying, you know, the hopes are really, really right up there. Do you regret that that was not done during your tenure? Yes, it was. I regret. But uh, let us see one thing that uh, the Nazi Faculty Corner Act was quite important in our lives. But also importantly, we had other legislations which we had to address. But the fact of the matter is that you have made a very important point. I wish we had gone through with that legislation. We would not have wasted a lot of time on these other things. So to us, it's important. So what I'm saying is that uh, I wish we had gone through with that legislation. You know, that is it. This is why even when President Bill came up with uh, this new repeal. I took very active part because I believe in it. Because everybody should believe in it because it's important to us with the journalists. To many observers, uh, IB, it would appear that you you appear to fall from the pecking order of the uh, Anis Baikuma government. You are Minister of Information and Communication, a very senior yes, cabinet course. position. And all of a sudden, um, you became presidential advisor and all of that. How did that get to you? I really do not know, but uh, these are the questions you would ask politicians. Um, state House was not my place. And if you remember, this is why I quickly left State House and went back to Parliament. We did not want to be, continue to be part of a process in which I did not believe. So to us, it's important that uh, we take it from that angle as well. 
I told them, I said, look, I said, this is not what I bargained for, but if this is what is going to be, then of course I will volunteer to go back to parliament to serve my people. And this is what I'll be right now. What aspect of his administration do you think he could have done better? Um, you mean the former president? The former president, Anas Lekroman. Of course, uh, it is all a matter of consultation. Uh, he did very well during the first term. And during the first term, believe me, he did extremely well because he consulted left and right. Then, of course, certain areas emerged that became very controversial and which even the donors would not accept. For example, the third term bid and all these other things, although the president himself never uttered the word, but there's always suspicion that he was looking forward to a third term bid, even that affected the very uh, character of the government of the day at the time. As a man who was uh, supposed to be advising the president, I got quite a number of telephone calls from abroad, from the diplomatic community, that don't touch that whole concept. We did not abide, uh, listen to it, and we ran into sim uh, simple difficulties of losing friendship uh, over the years. But to us, asking the question again, the administrative problem was that we undertook a program that was not accepted by both the donors and even the local people. As advisor, did you approach and it's like We did. Myself and uh, Ambassador Dauda Kamara, we did. We did raise the issue. I mean, Monty, Monty, uh, Monty Jones, we all did raise the issue. But the fact of the matter is that when presidents take decisions, it's not overnight that you can reverse them. To us, it's important that we take it from that angle as well. And one decision that he actually took again was the sacking of his vice president, um, Al Haji Samir Samsumana. It became a very uh, topical issue that took center stage across the country and perhaps even beyond. Where did you stand then? Well, of course, all of us had the, the, the thinking that uh, something has to be done to correct certain issues. But it was not corrected, and I remember I interviewed Samsumana and I made the recommendations. Well, like I said, the recommendations have a limit. Uh, the president has the final say. So to us, it's important. And again, going back to this uh, uh, third term bid, I remember I had face-to-face -face discussions with the president, and I told him that to us to test the policies of the people, can I travel throughout the country to find out what the people say about this thing? And he said, okay, why not? So I traveled to Bo, to Kenneba, to Kailau, to Konon, to everywhere, Makedi, everywhere. Most of the people I came across said, oh, no, he like the man very much. He's likable, but let him stay away from this top top thing. That was what almost everyone decided, and I reported to him. So this is the kind of thing. So we sometimes report. We sometimes advise. What did he say when you reported? I mean, talk to me about his demeanor. No, of course, he just said, uh, well, of course, he said, we'll look into it. If that is in the public say, this is what the public say, well, of course, we'll look at it. That is what he said. Well, the fact of the matter is that we all discovered later that it was an error. Right? And a good number of our colleagues also played into it because they thought that anybody who wanted to be a favorite of the president should be talking about top term, top term, top term, even though the president himself did not fully adhere to that. But, uh, of course, that was what happened. If you're just joining us, the program is Bottom Line and it's coming to you from a humble room here at Western Freetown. We'll now go for a short break and we'll come back, we'll discuss further issues with our guest, Al Haji Ibrahim Ben Kabu, the Honorable Member of Parliament. Welcome back to the program, Bottom Line. My guest tonight is the Honorable Alhaji Ibrahim Ben Kago, former president of the Sierra Leone Association of Journalists Large, 
former Minister of Information and Communications, and now the Honourable Member of Parliament. Um, I'd like to welcome back to this. Oh, thank you very much. Now, you were talking, a bit, talking to me about your the governance system of uh, the former president, um, Ernest Baikoma, and then when you were advisor to him. But then as Minister of Information and Communications, what um, tangible strides, uh, developments, personally, do you think you, you, know, um, you led and achieved um, successfully? Well, of course, like I said earlier or elsewhere, uh, the president will always listen to some of our suggestions. For example, if you take the landing of the submarine cable, which was his own idea, really, he listened to us, and we thought that it was necessary for us to land the cable here because the digital aspects of the state has to be improved. And he accepted it, and we landed the submarine cable without much difficulty. And also we looked at uh, our commitments of the United Nations system about uh, handling the SLBC, uh, the transition from the SLBS to the SLBC, and he allowed us, he gave us the opportunity, and we worked towards the transition. And I think it was also very successful. We also introduced governance structures such as the attitudinal change, um, which became a very, very important program, but has been phased out now. And then, of course, the OGI and all of these things. Um, and these are things I put together to make sure that uh, we had a program that will that will address the basic governance problems of the state. So we went to that extent, went as far as that point, and uh, I'm sure that the president would always agree that he cooperated with us in that regard. And uh, we are happy that uh, we got the results that we got uh, from the introduction of those institutions, uh, the attitudinal change, the SLBC, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm happy that uh, we did that. So that was what happened. But of course, like I said earlier on, uh, in certain cases, you also need more than just support. You need actual implementation of programs. That was what happened. So to us, we're satisfied. In a sense, you are saying uh, you are really not given the hands-on uh, those programs. Well, of course, the resources were not always available because you also need very important resources. For example, the reason why the submarine cable became a successful phenomenon was clearly because it was funded very, very copiously by the World Bank. And uh, the other institutions that were not properly funded did not have the same attention as uh, the submarine cable. So it's important. But I'm very proud that we landed the cable in this country. Let's talk about your experience as advisor you know, to um, the president, former president. How is it like? What's the relationship like? How do you approach these people and the president to talk to them about certain governance issues and all of this? How challenging can it be in your experience? Well, of course, in my own case, I was already a very senior person in this society. And therefore, my relationship with the president would not be too much of a core relationship. Uh, so he looked at me as an elder brother. And uh, sometimes I also spoke to him as a younger brother. Where there are mistakes, you come out with the, with the advice. And sometimes when the advice is not accepted, that's the most you can do. You cannot do more than that. But the fact of the matter, I had no difficulty in uh, our relations. He respected me. Uh, don't, don't forget that uh, I was already a very senior person in this society. Uh, when he became president. And I also know that I played a major role in making him become president of Sierra Leone. Do we know that role? The role is that uh, we did so, a lot of PR for him. I was president of Sludge. The boys would not move too much because they think that, oh, I think I go has a friend that this and that. Well, the fact of the matter is that uh, we would not... Is it a case that you used Sludge? No, we did, not, we did not use Sludge. In fact, all that happened in the case of Sludge was to make sure that sludge did not go out of direction. Don't forget that we had two strong candidates at the time, Anas Koroma Kene, Berewa, who would not sit down and allow anybody to hoodwink him, and Anas Koroma himself. Well, all he wanted to do is to play a balancing role so that nobody uh, cries foul. So to us, that is important. And like, what's the nexus between your newspaper then, the Citizen newspaper, um, 
that was, you know, funny called Tolumbo. You would even see it um, on the front page, the New Citizen Tolumbo newspaper. And what became the slogan of the Old People's Congress, Tolumbo? I don't know how they, they took it. <laughs> Believe me, I must confess, I don't know. I was surprised myself when I heard that uh, people were calling my newspaper Tolumbo. Their own, their own efforts, Tolobo. No, my newspaper was Tolobo. And you know how it, it came by? Um, went to a conference at UE building, at Meta Conference Center, and uh, I was about to ask Sheka Stevens a question. I raised my hand, and he said, okay, Tolobo, you ask the next question. So the other journalist took that name. What does that mean? That is straightforward without uh, deviating. So that was what happened. So really, I don't know how the APC came to take over that name. I know that it was a name that was uh, first used in, the, in that regard by Shaka Stevens, who wanted to make a joke with me. And suddenly, the, the people in the APC took it over and started using it. I don't use it, if you watch me closely. It's very, very rare that I use the word Tolumbo because it's not part of my, my vocabulary. I know that uh, Tolumbo... It all started with you? Sorry? It all started with you in the days of Shekhar Stevens? Yes. You are a member of the All People's Congress? Yes. You serve that government? Tolumbo can only be common. No, of course. No, but of course, I cannot uh, accept it as part of my vocabulary. It, I cannot. Because I told them in the first place, after the word was used, uh, I said, no, I said, this is you are going to make it difficult for me to market even my paper. You are making it too political. And I did not like it at all because they made it political up to this day. Some of my reporters are complaining that they perceive us as a political paper. And I, I agree with them. Talk to me about um, your parliamentary bid. What informed your decision to run for a seat in parliament? Well, remember that my first effort to go to parliament was not my own effort. It was in 1985 that uh, President Momo nominated me, consistent with the constitution of this country, to serve in parliament. And I served in parliament as a member of parliament, a nominated member of parliament. And during that period, I also became the Secretary General of the Parliamentary Backbencher Association, went to Bangura was the chairman. So I was like that until I decided at some point that I should leave. And I went into full-time politics and I was appointed minister later, etc., etc. But the fact of the matter is that when I returned to parliament, I had to contest the election very fiercely with other people like Kamari Ba and others this and that. And uh, we won. It was a difficult fight. It was tough. But of course, I always believe in proper contests. And I also believe in democratic practice. Uh, so we won the elections. And so I went there for the first time. In fact, it was a by-election that took me the second term. Uh, because uh, the member of parliament had died, Dr. Turi, And I went there straight away to replace him. And then after that, I continued the whole process. And I won again to become the member of parliament of Kondra 034 in the Bambalu district. So this is where I am at the moment. Um, before we come to probably proceedings in parliament, I mean, this second inning um, um, to parliament came at a time when your party lost the general elections at the All People's Congress, but then you are still member, elected member of parliament. Um, do you agree with those who believe that one reason probably for the defeat of the All People's Congress in the 2018 elections, so they about, was so much around this desire by the former president to select and not to allow election within the, the party, you know, for those who actually want to contest? Well, that is a, one school of thought. And I agree that uh, if we had actually elected the candidates, instead of selecting them, it would have created a different scenario. Uh, but that does not guarantee that, uh, it never guaranteed that uh, 
the nominee would automatically become president. But of course, it would have enhanced the democratic process. So what I also want to advise at every given time is that allow the people to have their say. So that, in fact, if anything goes wrong, you always have somebody to say, look, I did not do it alone. You, we did it together. And uh, it's a How did this happen in your case uh, during the award of symbol? Is it, was it something that you contested for or you were appointed? No, no we had about uh, five of us contested for it. Okay. Five of us. And I had uh, people who wanted to be president, people who wanted to be this. And I remember that I had to go through the whole grill of being interviewed, wanting to know what I was going to do, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Even when I told them that, oh, look, I'm a very old uh, politician now. They said, no, this, are, this is what the law says. But of course, I went through the grill, and a good number of people, uh, one of them, one Dr. Sisse, one of them, one other John Sisse, and others, all of us contested. Uh, Dr. Bob Conte, all of us contested. It was not an easy task. In the end, I came out strongest. The Old People's Congress now have a new constitution. They do. And now it talks about um, election and no longer uh, selection. How do you feel about that? That is a popular view and I, su I support that. Believe me, we do, not have, we do not need any more selections. Let us go to the grid, let us go to the polls and elect the people of our own choice. So that is my position and I will always maintain that position. Talk to me about life in Parliament. How is it like? Well, Parliament is quite an interesting place. Like I told you, this is the third time right I'm going to Parliament. And I also want to, you also make a good number of friends there. Over the years, I've made quite a number of friends in Parliament. And it, they bring, the whole process brings people together. When you operate in Parliament, you really do not care whether that man is from Kailang, whether it's from Bo, whether from, you are all just one united people trying to work for the benefits of the country, and also making sure that uh, you work as a team uh, to improve the, the status of the Sierra Union. So this is what we have been doing all the years. And of course, if you go to parliament, you go, sometimes go to parliament, you discover that uh, we are the same, we consider ourselves the same people. I remember I was in the speaker's office one afternoon, and a lady came in, a civil servant, she came in and she discovered I was in a heated argument with the speaker. And I told the speaker that he was totally inefficient in handling certain things. And the lady said, and the, the speaker said, they say, Mr. Kango, look, don't tell about inefficiency. I was a senior in school. I said, just by a few days. <laughs> so we had this kind of joke. So when we entered, the lady said, I did not know that anyone could get to this point of uh, making jokes. I said, well, this, we are not enemies here. Yeah? But the public sometimes think that uh, we, the APC, we, the SLPP, are always enemies. We must find ways by which we confront ourselves. But we don't confront ourselves all the time. Sometimes we are friends. And we have just come from France, where we had a delegation from the C4C, from the APC, from the SLPP, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We all moved together. We ate together. And we came back together. That is the kind of society we enjoy in Parliament. You are the um, deputy, if you like, um, minority, minority leader, leader yes. in parliament. What's your relationship like with the current executive of the All People's Congress Party? No, well, of course, I remember the NAC, which makes it very, very imperative that I attend almost all the meetings of uh, NAC, the National Advisory Committee. And I'm held in high esteem there. And uh, don't forget that I've been a member of uh, uh, of uh, the party for a very, very long period. And uh, like I keep on reminding people that... Uh, Were you a member during your days as president of Sludge? No, as Sludge, no, but before Sludge, I was a member. Uh, I was the, the, the member who, the PR, the, the public relations officer of the party years back during the days of Shaka Stevens. When did you cease being a member? After some time. Shaka Sibin, after Shaka Sibin's left, I also left. So this is it. So we have all of these relationships. And I go to the NAC meetings and they discuss it with me. This is the reason why I tell you that uh, most of these things are coming to the fore now. We want democracy to return. 
We have seen it all. We have seen the Shekasimi type, we have seen the Bobo type, we have seen the Kaba type. For some of us, we really now want real democratic practice within our own party. So this is what we are talking about. Let's talk about the current government and the governance system of the, uh, led by the Sierra Leone People's Party. I mean, you experienced the days of the um, um, then president, Alaji Dr. Ahmad Tijan Kaba, um, former president, Anand Bai Kuruma, and now president, Dr. Julius Mada Bio. How would you, um, if you like, sample efforts you know, to drive this country towards development? Well, like I said, and I already said that um, uh, Kaba is a different story. Because Kaba was psychologically prepared for the presidency. And uh, as Kuruman too came in, he had the resources to be president. Uh, Madabio came later. And like we said, those of us who are in the APC, we have been misunderstood sometimes. But the moment Madabio came in, we agreed, all of us, even if privately, that we should give these people an opportunity to run the state at least for some time. But of course, where the problem started brewing was when we started discovering that uh, our people were arrested, locked up, and this and that. So that kind of goodwill dissipated. But definitely I'll tell you that we held a meeting and we said that we should not antagonize this new government. We should allow it to operate. But of course, I don't know what went wrong that it was not allowed to operate because in the first place, we just thought that uh, the, the SLPP had mature people already who would make sure that uh, we run the state properly. Talk to me about this flagship program, the free and quality education. What would you have to say in respect of that vision? No, well, we said that it's a fantastic program and we think that that was a uh, a clear indication that the president had a thinking, a clear thinking, before he came to office about the educational sector. And we will contribute to, so we we'll continue to support him. We members of parliament, even though we are in the APC, we decided we contributed money to make sure that uh, the, 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 the free quality education succeeds. Because to us, it's important that it succeed. Because once it succeeds, the entire system will succeed. So, like, an only, like I always said, that uh, the the matter of your program, especially as it regards the education, must be commended to us as a successful program. Generally, Alaji, how do you think the opposition can be of aid and support to any government in power? Well, of course, it can always be. I, because what we, um, is that the opposition attempts to stifle also um, efforts made by, by Really yeah, well, of course, that is not a proper perception. If you take the case of Kaba, for example, you discover that some of us who are in APC supported his programs. We actually helped him to build his programs. So that is not the case at all. And uh, you also discover that even the President Bill, most of his policies we have supported in Parliament. We have supported all his Parliament. He nominates people. He wants to give them jobs. We support it almost a hundred percent. The only thing we would always ask for is to go according to the accepted process. To us, it's important. But okay. it is not true that uh, the opposition always opposes the government of the day. No, it is not. What's next for Alahaji Ibrahim Ben Kabo? You running again for a seat in parliament in the coming elections? I may not run for a seat in parliament, but I may run for something higher than that. What's um, that? I will tell you later. When I want it, I will call you for a special interview. Are we talking about the leadership of the All People's Congress? Yeah, the leadership of the All People's Congress is also very important. But the important thing is that I think I have now graduated above just a member of parliament. Are we talking about the flag leadership of the opposition All People's Congress party? <laughs> of course, that is possible. But we'll talk about it later on. And as we try to conclude this interview, Alaji, they want to talk to me about your political base. I know we'll be expecting another call, probably, to have another interview in respect of your ambition, in respect of your vision for the leadership of this country, if at all. What base are you drawing that support from? 
went from the people, from my political party, and also generally, uh, I'm very, very happy that I've always grown up to be a total Sierra Leonean. Not a northerner, not a Timney, not a Mendy. And this is from where, that's where I got my base, from the ordinary people of Sierra Leone. So the friends I have made in this country come from every part of this country. And if I really want to marginalize myself, I could just stay away from them. But I would not because they are my strength. They are my power. The Mendes, the Susus, the Kisis, and others, these are all my friends put together. In the last elections, the All People's Congress had about 20 or over 20 aspirants. Yes. Uh, where would you situate Alhaji um, Ibrahim Ben Kabo as we prepare for the next elections? Well, of course, the position is very, very clear. This time around, we are going to elect people. If you are confident that you can win, you present yourself for election. We are not going to go back to that, that, that rowdy kind of arrangement of the last election. But I assure you that when the time comes, we'll give you a very good candidate. And this is... Uh, Am I talking to that candidate? It's possible, but uh, let us see something else. I'm trying to tell you that uh, the elections will come out. You'll have very good candidates, and those candidates will be to your satisfaction. What do you think sets you apart? Should you decide to run for the leadership or the flag bearership of your party? What special qualities do you think set you apart from probably other aspirants? No, well, the fact of the matter is that I've been at it for years. I'm better known than most of them. In terms of my background, I'm better known than most of them. But the fact of the matter is that I also am very, very proud that I have a character to maintain. I have nothing to hide. So also it's important that is also taken into consideration. When do we expect your next book? Well, actually, uh, I have almost completed. I've almost completed the book. Really, if it were not for us to redo some of Madhavio's columns, chapters, I would have published it by now. But of course, we had to do some things on Madhavio. Because Maki, by the time Mara Bill came into power, we had almost completed a book. And it would have been most unfair for us to write a book, publish it, without mentioning the pivotal role of Mara Bill. We are completing it now. Even last night, I was at it for a very, very long time. What legacy do you expect young folk, journalists coming up, a good number of them, who read about you, who now see you, and they who want to be like you, what legacy would they rely on? Well, like I said, the legacy component of it is very important. Uh, like I keep on saying, your ethics, the level of ethics, your, your status in society, make sure that when you're given a job, you perform that job very, very remarkably well. To us, it's important. Don't go about accepting jobs if you know that you're going to loaf. And I will not tolerate that. So that is what has happened. I have tried my very best over the years to make sure that whatever assignment I take or I accept, I perform remarkably well to us. It's important. So you talk about the legacy of IB Kagu. The legacy of IB Kagu is I've always decided to do the right things. I've decided always to do the correct things. To us, it's important that we do it that way. And thank you very much for this interview. Well, that's the Honorable Alahaji Ibrahim Ben Kago, uh, former president of the Sierra Leone Association of Journalists, CLAJ. He is also, well, the former minister, government minister of the Ministry of Information and Communications, and he's been sharing with us his experience as a journalist, as a government minister, and also as a member of parliament. Hope you enjoyed this program. Well, we expect to have another interview very soon yes. when the Honorable Alhaji Brendan Kabo will be telling us more about his vision for this country. Until then, many thanks to all of you, those who joined us on radio, those who joined us on television, and those who have been following all our programs on all our platforms. Hope you enjoy this edition. If you missed part of all of this edition, we are back with a repeat broadcast at a later date. Otherwise, Many thanks to members of the technical crew. As usual, this program was produced by Tilly Kuruma. 
The name is Joseph Ibinda Kapua. I wish you all a pleasant evening. Bye-bye.